Earlier this year, Kimi Raikkonen announced that he will be retiring at the end of this year, marking the end of a good 20-year stint in the sport he joined in 2001, 2021 will be his final, final, final year. But then straight after the announcement, he got a positive Rona test, which meant he missed the Dutch and the Italian Grand Prix, which kind of took the wings out of the sails of the news, where you've got F1's longest standing driver. He's competed in more races than any driver ever in the sport. He's retiring, it's huge news, and it just kind of got swept under the carpet a bit, which I'm sure Kimi didn't mind, because we know he doesn't like media, right? Kimi Matthias Raikkonen is a legend in every sense of the word in the sport. So today we're going to look back through his career basically and refresh ourselves and what he's achieved, what he's done and how these 20 years have panned out for him. And quickly, quickly go down, like the video and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of my stuff in the future. Let's get cracking. 2001, Sauber. Starting with his debut season in 2001, Kimi Raikkonen got the call up to Sauber. The same team he's ending his career with, which is nice. Now, Kimi had a very short but very stellar junior career, which got enough attention to get the call up. In fact, he only competed in 23 open wheel competitive races before he got his call up to Formula One. 23 all in bloody Formula Renaults. Though he did win 13 of those 23 races, so you can see why he caught some attention. Peter Sauber gave him a test in 2000, which merited the call up. Although FIA president Max Mosley at the time wasn't particularly happy with a driver with that little experience jumping in to motorsports top tier. Which, I mean, I don't blame him. 23 races in Formula Renault isn't many, but they did it anyway. And Kimi rewarded Sauber by scoring a P6 on his debut in Australia, rising from P13 where he qualified on the grid. Yes, they had a lot of testing back then, don't get me wrong, but don't get it twisted, like... Doing that well in a car that was as mediocre as the Sauber was at the time, very good. As for the rest of that debut season, Kimi managed two P4s and a P5. In fact, every single race he finished that debut season, he finished in the top 10. Again, in a Sauber that wasn't terrible, but wasn't great either. Kimi ended the season on nine points behind teammate Nick Heidfeld with 12. It was a mad impressive first year and because Sauber was Ferrari powered at the time, a lot of the rumours knocking about at the time were that he would move to Ferrari and partner Michael Schumacher. Imagine Schumacher Rakkonen in 2002, that would have been otherworldly. Didn't happen though, Ron Dennis swooped in with a bit of help from Mika Hakkonen to replace the Finn with Kimi Rakkonen. 2002-2006, McLaren. Once again, Kimi came into a new team, second year in the sport, and absolutely hit the ground running. A P3 in his first ever race with McLaren was exceptionally good, fantastic. Unfortunately, he was plagued by hilarious unreliability in that season. He didn't finish 10 out of 17 races, especially when you consider the title winner Michael Schumacher finished every single race that year and every single race on the podium as well. Teammate David Coulthard would finish ahead of Kimi in the standards, but David only retired from four races that year not 10, so fair enough. Because of the seven races Kimi did finish that year, he got one P2, three P3s, and two P4s. Very good. On to 2003, and it started in exactly the same way as 2002 did, with a P3 finish at Australia. And 2003, for me, is definitely, it's the one that got away. Three retirements all season really did cost Kimi the title, especially when you consider he finished two points behind a Michael Schumacher, who only retired once all year. Kimi did only win one race that season, which is mad because he only finished two points off the top. Almost won the title without winning a race. But seven P2s, two P3s, two P4s and one P6 was an insanely consistent season. This was also the year where you had Interlagos absolutely rained out. Tons of cars binned it, including Michael. Kimi was awarded the win, but then afterwards, because they red flagged the race the wrong point, Giancarlo Fisichella was given the victory. Not that those extra two points would have made a difference because Michael got more wins than Kimi that year, but still. That Schumacher Ferrari over 2001, 2002 didn't have a single technical failure DNF. That's incredible. Then on to 2004, and Kimi must have been having some flashbacks to 2002, I think. Schumi, of course, walked the title 13 out of 18 races he won. They had eight one twos as well, Ferrari, which just proved the pace of that car relative to the field. Raikkonen, on the other hand, retired from 8 out of 18 races that year. 
He did still manage a win, two P2s and a P3, to show that there was a very good car underneath him when it didn't break. Comfortably clear of Coulthard as well, but again, it must have been a real frustrating year for Kimi to come so close in 2003 and then to have unreliability just destroy any chance of fighting in 2004. Then on to 2005, which saw change at McLaren. David Coulthard left for Jaguar, which had just become Rebel Racing, and McLaren bought in the absolute geezer Juan Pablo Montoya from Williams. What a lineup! Montoya Raikkonen. They couldn't stop Fernando Alonso from delivering El Blan. A regulation shakeup, which was essentially designed to nerf the Ferraris, meant all the Bridgestone runners struggled because cars had to be able to take the tyre a full Grand Prix length. The Michelin runners did well, the Bridgestone runners did not. Fernando had the stronger start to that season, winning four of the first seven races, but then Kimi had a really good end, winning four of the last seven. But ultimately, Fernando's consistency over the course of the season meant he finished 21 points clear of Kimi in the end, which was equal to over two whole race wins. Kimi was very clear of Juan Pablo Montoya, though, although JPM did suffer about five more DNFs slash disqualifications over the course of that year. Raikkonen definitely didn't let Alonso have it easy that year. He won seven races all season. I mean, that was a season where he came back from P17 at Suzuka to win the race, passing Giancarlo Fisichella on the final lap into the first corner. What a move that was. What a race. And Kimi did win Autosports International Racing Driver of the Year that year, ahead of Fernando. So it's not all bad. And then on to 2006, Kimi's final year at McLaren wasn't so great once again. It was such a yo-yo time, McLaren. There'd be great car, good reliability, then terrible reliability mainly, to be fair. 2006 was just another bad one. He finished P5 at the end of the year behind both Renaults and both Ferraris. Got six DNFs over the course of the season, which when you considered between Alonso and Schumacher who were fighting for the title, they only had two between them. JPM also departed McLaren halfway through the season, going to NASCAR, citing a loss of love for Formula One. Fair play to him, good for him. Pedro de la Rosa came in and replaced JPM. Actually did a pretty good job towards the end of that year. Kimi scored two P2s and four P3s that season, which did show that that car had potential to fight at the top. But with so many DNFs and the outright performance wasn't quite there with Renault and Ferrari. A Raikkonen McLaren world title wasn't to be. You can understand when Schumacher announced his retirement at the end of 2006 why Kimi was like, I'm going to take that seat. Also, McLaren had already announced that Alonso was coming to McLaren. So, I mean, there was a lot of politics between, you know, the Schumacher Alonso Raikkonen thing at the time. I won't get into it in this video, but you can understand why he departed for the Scuderia. 2007 to 2009, Ferrari. So Kimi had signed a three-year deal at Ferrari to replace Michael Schumacher sitting alongside Felipe Massa, with Nando and a young rookie by the name of Lewis Hamilton joining McLaren. We all know how this season went, don't we? One of the most competitive seasons we've seen in recent Formula 1 history, for sure. Felipe Massa finished fourth, three wins all season, 16 points off of the top spot. Then you had the McLarens, Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton, and one point ahead to take his one and only Drivers World Championship was Kimi Raikkonen. What a hero. What a legend. Six wins all year, more than anybody else, and put together loads of podium finishes towards the end of the season to snatch that title away from, particularly from Lewis Hamilton, who finished P7 in the final race, and Fernando Alonso, who finished P3. The thing is, this could have easily gotten away. I would say that, you know, if anything, I felt that Kimi deserved the 2003 title probably more than he deserved this one. He had to rely on Hamilton having a really, really bad final race and Alonso not getting that P2. You've got to remember, Fernando was going for his third championship on the bounce at that time. But fortunately, they didn't do it. Kimi took the title, the first of many we hoped. Because unfortunately, 2008 was far, far, far less successful. Finishing P3 in the championship, 22 points behind teammate Felipe Massa. It's never good when you're beaten by your teammate. We know how Felipe lost that title by one point to Lewis at the very end. Kimi actually started the season pretty well. He was leading the championship going into round six at Monaco, but then a string of four races on the bounce with zero points between Europe and Singapore took away any shot at the driver's title. And then on to 2009, big rule shakeup, and Honda, who'd finished P9 in the constructors the season prior, 
would become Braun, which would give Jensen Button the car to win the championship. Mad. That'd be like Alfa Romeo winning the championship next year. Think how bizarre that sounds. Kimi's teammate Felipe Massa had that freak accident at the Hungarian Grand Prix with the old spring hitting him in the, uh, in the helmet. Was very, very, very lucky to escape with his life. It's well known that Ferrari didn't adapt well to the new regulations in 2009. Kimi still managed to win in Belgium, but only one P2 and three P3s for the rest of the year. Red Bull and the Brauns were very much clear that year. And then came the Ferrari breakup. Just before the Japanese Grand Prix, round 15 of 17 of that season, it was announced that Kimi Raikkonen would be replaced at Ferrari by Fernando Alonso. But remember what I said at the start, Kimi signed a three-year deal with Ferrari. So that should have been taken into the end of 2010. So what's going on? Well, it's like we saw with Sergio Perez when he got replaced by Vettel at Racing Point slash Aston Martin. Perez still had a contract, but I mean, you can buy people out of contracts and that's kind of what Ferrari did. I don't know how much Sergio received to be bought out of his contracts. There's various sources online, but no kind of consistent number. But as for Kimi... It's reported that he got paid by Ferrari 20 million quid to not race that car in 2010. So essentially buy him out of his contract. 20 million. Why? I mean, yes, Massa had had the upper hand on Kimi in 2008. But then obviously in 2009, Massa was still recovering from his freak accident. But Ferrari did have confidence he would return by that stage. Maybe Kimi just didn't have the character Ferrari were looking for. Although I think it's more probably to do with Santander, the Spanish bank who were sponsoring Fernando Alonso at the moment. You've got to remember 2008 was a massive economic crisis. So that money coming into Ferrari would have been very tempting. And we know how good Fernando is as well. So it wasn't like they're just getting a paid driver for a paid driver. They're getting Fernando bloody Alonso. But that was it. Kimi wasn't prepared to stay in Formula 1 if he couldn't be given competitive machinery and no one offered him one, so he left. Kimi joined the WRC for a season in the bit, didn't really have much success, wasn't terrible, wasn't great. And he also raced in NASCAR trucks in the States, which is pretty cool. I could picture Kimi wanting to dabble during that time, but the pull of F1 was always going to drag him back in. 2012 to 2013, Lotus. Renault had sold their stake in the Enstone based team by 2012. So the team was now known as Lotus F1 team and they wanted Kimi. They had actually tried to get him in 2011, but Kimi wasn't having it, whether he was just enjoying his rally cars too much back then. Maybe. But 2012 was the right time. Sat alongside Romain Grosjean. They did a pretty good job. Kimi finished the championship in P3 ahead of both McLarens, Lewis Hamilton and Jensen Button. He got a win in Abu Dhabi, three P2s and three P3s all season. In fact, he only finished outside the top 10 once all year. So the man came back in and he hadn't lost it. He beat his teammate Grosjean, who was hindered by like seven retirements all season, including getting disqualified after he yeeted himself over Alonso at Spa. Didn't he come out recently and say he thought Hamilton was partly at fault for that crash? Like, I like your old man, but no, it was, it was definitely your fault. And then 2013 was pretty good as well. First race of the season, Australia, everyone's starting afresh. Kimi wins, great start. P7 in Malaysia, not so great, but then three P2s on the trot. Could it have been a genuine championship challenge? And no, Sebastian Vettel was a thing. He won nine races in a row in 2013, absolutely dominating the title. Grosjean did a good job as well. They both did a good job in a car that was decent, but no one could touch Seb that season. He was just operating on another level. Kimi did also miss the final two races of the season. He needed back surgery, so he finished like 16 points behind Mark Webber in the end. And to be fair, Kimi did so well, like Lotus weren't expecting them to be that good over the stint that he almost bankrupted the team. If you want to hear a bit more about that and why he still owed about $6 million, you should give this Aidan Millwood video a watch. Very interesting. Watch it after mine, but do watch it because Aidan's quality. 2012 and 13 was a fantastic return to the sport for the Iceman. He'd lost a bit of face, to be fair, after 2008, 2009, where, you know, Felipe Massa beat him in 2008. He wasn't great in 2009. I think there were a few doubts around Kimi Raikkonen. He needed to come back and do well. And he did so well that Ferrari came crawling back. The team who'd paid him 20 million to not do anything in 2010. How the turntables. 
2014 to 2018 Ferrari. I do wonder how that went. The first time Kimi went back to Ferrari in 2014 after he'd essentially swindled them out of 20 mil. No, you know, like Ferrari gave him the contract. They wanted Alonso. Fair enough. Santander must have put up big money. That must have felt good at the start. Problem is, it wouldn't have felt good by the end of the year because that season, no. This was the start of the Mercedes turbo hybrid domination. Lewis, of course, won the title. And the Ferraris were nowhere, but especially Kimi. Teammate with Fernando Alonso, who'd remained at the team. He finished P6 in the Drivers' Championship with 161 points. Not bad. Not terrible. Kimi finished down P12 with just 55 points. And he only retired from one race all season, so you can't blame it on unreliability. He just, him and the car just didn't go together well at all. To be fair, Fernando finishing P6 did show that, you know, that Ferrari wasn't a great car. But, yeah, not good for Kimi. Then, of course, 2015 saw Sebastian Vettel come in, replace Fernando Alonso to sit alongside Kimi at Ferrari. And for the second season in a row, Kimi wasn't able to keep up. Five retirements all year didn't help Kimi's calls, but that car could win races. Seb won three all season. Kimi's best results, on the other hand, were one P2 and a couple of P3s. He finished 128 points behind his teammate. Not good. 2016 was a lot better in relation to Seb, anyway. Neither of them got any wins, but Kimi only finished 28 points behind Vettel, which is a big improvement. They were both pretty consistent relative to each other, but they were also both still nowhere near the Mercedes who were, you know, crashing into each other up the front where Rosberg won his title. So fair play. But then 2017 was another return down and, and that gap between him and Seb really opened up. We obviously know Seb challenged for the title that year, particularly in the first half of the season, 11 races in out of 20. Seb was 14 points ahead of Lewis Hamilton. This was big. Kimi, on the other hand, finished the season 112 points behind Sebastian, only took two P2s all year. By this stage, it was very clear that Kimi Raikkonen was the number two driver at Ferrari. Vettel was Ferrari's only chance of beating the Mercedes. So when 2018 came along, expectations around Ferrari were very, very hopeful. And once again, it was looking good, if not better than in 2017. Seb would have probably finished that Hockenheim Grand Prix 15 points ahead of Lewis Hamilton if he hadn't have binned it into the wall in the rain. That car was a potential championship winning car, but Kimi still finished 69 points behind Sebastian Vettel. He did finish ahead of Max and Valtteri, and he did finally get a win on his return to Ferrari, the 2018 USA Grand Prix. Finally, as he very aptly put himself. But it wasn't enough to ensure a constructor's crown with Ferrari finishing 84 points behind Mercedes. And that was it. Kimi's time at Ferrari was done. Charles Leclerc had had a fantastic rookie season at Alfa Romeo Sauber. Three P7s in the final three races. Best of the rest in a Sauber. Ferrari Driver Academy talent. It was a no-brainer that they snapped up Charles. And Kimi went in the other direction, returning back to where it all began. 2019-2021 Alfa Romeo Sauber. Kimi's return to Himwill to Sauber has been a clear twilight of his career. He said it himself, it's a hobby to him, which I don't have a problem with. You know what I mean? Like, he's clearly still got the ability. We've seen it in races over these last three years where he's delivered really, really, really good performances. He's in the top three of that Crypto.com Overtake Championship thing, which suggests he can still drive. Yes, he's been pretty consistently outqualified by Giovinazzi over the three-year period, but Kimi typically finishes ahead, has always finished either joint or ahead in the Drivers' Championship by the end of the season because his race pace is much better than Gio's. 2019 was decent. Obviously, he got that P4 in Intel Argos, that well-forgotten P4, inherited when Lewis got penalised for... Yeah, I'm not going to talk about it. He got three P7s as well that year. That was a really good season for Kimi. But unfortunately, as well, you can't talk about Kimi's Alfa Romeo Sauber end of his career, not talk about, you know, there, there have been really frustrating mistakes, which just, for me, are indicative of someone who isn't as driven and is in the end of their career. You know, when he just drove into Seb in Austria, when he just drove into his teammate at Portimao, like he wasn't concentrating. Like it's, it's those little things that have frustrated me about Kimi's recent performances and, and why when he did announce his retirement, I was like, yeah, this is the right time. And just like Mika Hakkinen passed the McLaren baton to Kimi in 2002, Kimi will be passing the Afro Mouse Alba baton onto another Finn in Valtteri Bottas, which is quite poignant. Q1 
Kimi Raikkonen is an absolute trailblazer of the sport. I just, I have so much respect for the way he just came in and was nothing other than himself. You know, media training exists for a reason, but none of that worked on Kimi. He was always 100% himself, whether you like that or not. He's about as pure as a racer gets. He's not there for the clout. He's not there for the fame. He did earn some good money along the way, but you can tell he's there because he loves racing. That's why he's still doing it at 42 years of age. That's why he's spent almost half of his entire adult life racing in Formula One. What's next for Kimi? I don't know. Look, the world's open to him. Obviously, he's got a young family. Will he carry on racing? I reckon he will. I mean, that itch is going to need to be scratched. Maybe he'll jump back into rallying. Who knows? He's got his merchandise line with West Coast Choppers as well. Maybe he'll dive into that a bit more. Who knows what the future holds for Kimi? But I'll tell you what, it's been an absolute pleasure to watch him over the years, especially that like 2003 Kimi Raikkonen. For me, him in that car at that time is one of my favourite driver car combinations of all time. I was so young. I was like 10 years old when that was a thing. And yeah, thank you, Kimi. Thank you for the years. It's been a pleasure. Give me your favourite Kimi stories in the comments down below. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do this video because I think it, it's, yeah, it is the end of an era. And uh, yeah. Kimmy's just been such a mad, crazy, unique character in the sport. And it will be sad to not see him on the grid. But there we have it. I'm done. My name's Tomo. Thanks again. Have a good one. Ta-da.